wonderful to be um, preaching or anything without looking at myself. You know, all the cameras we have and all the Zoom, you mu mostly, I don't know whether this is just a female characteristic, but a lot of f fussing with my hair. And, and now I can't see it at all, so I think it's perfect. Um, so on Good Friday night, as we were going to bed, it was around 11 o'clock, we heard a cry from somewhere in the woods and yards that surround our house. We couldn't identify it. There are a lot of mating calls going on this time of year, so we listened carefully. We had actually earlier seen um, a, a bevy of um, turkey beauties being um, lured by turkeys were pushing, you know, fanning out their tails. So we thought perhaps it might be something like that. But when we listened carefully, we see, could see or hear it was a solitary cry coming only from one direction. I went out on our deck to listen more carefully. The cry continued, unusually loud for nocturnal sounds. It was coming from a dark wooded area on our property. But the most notable thing was that the source direction was not moving. The animal was not moving. It could not move. I was hearing George Floyd call for his mother. We don't hear injured animals cry out, not in the quiet of a suburban town. In fact, the animal instinct is exactly the opposite, to stay quiet and unseen so predators would not be able to locate it. We probably heard it for about five more minutes and then it stopped. And I think I know what that meant. Crying out in any form is an act of hope. And hope is quite the scariest emotion there is. Will a cry for help be heard, be attended to, responded to? Or will we end up still in pain and adding disappointment and embarrassment to it? Hope in the face of concrete evidence. Hope when you've seen the death. Hope when you absolutely, positively know there is no reason to hope. Radical hope that what is dead can be alive again. Radical hope that a person may be fully human and fully divine. Radical hope so hard to hang on to. Perhaps that is why in resurrection scriptures in the gospel, in each, the women are approaching the tomb with the intention of anointing Jesus's body and wrapping it with herbs. Jesus had told the disciples that he would be suffering but would rise again on the third day. He told them this over and over again. Yet still they believe it will be his body they encounter, not his person. Perhaps it is that fear of hope that draws us deep into Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. The retelling of these stories, the reenacting of them, are rich and powerful. We feel them and understand them. We can imagine them. In a way, Mark's resurrection telling suits our discomfort with hope. Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, and Salome are surprised when the stone has been rolled away. But even when they enter the tomb, they are still expecting to find Jesus' body. When they see its absence and hear the youth from the youth that Jesus has been raised, 
Scripture says they are alarmed. As the figure in white robes tells them that Jesus has gone on to Galilee, when they are reassured that Jesus is alive, when they are instructed to go and tell the disciples and Peter to go to Galilee and meet Jesus there, when all these revelations are rolled out, the women were seized by terror and amazement, so much so that they fled. They didn't run or go or take off. They fled from something. They fled in fear. They fled from hope, from a hope so great, so unbelievable, that they did not tell anyone. They fled from a hope that so mirrored their own heart's desire, they dare not believe it. And that is where Mark's telling of the resurrection ends. That is where Mark, the book of Mark, ends. There are no resurrection appearances in Mark. There is only the third person statement. He has left and gone to Galilee. When I wrote this sermon, I had not yet read um, an editorial in the New York Times by um, Esau Macaulay, who is a, a professor at Wheaton College. But I read it, actually, this morning, and it was so... So much, so much what I had wanted or have wanted to say, was trying to say, that I added in his more elegant parts. And I will identify them so you don't think, so I don't, I'm not, it's not uh, plagiarism. It's um, honoring him. He says Mark's ending points to a truth that often gets lost in the celebration. Easter is a frightening prospect. For the women, the only thing more terrifying than a world with Jesus dead was one in which Jesus was alive. We know what to do with grief and despair. We have a place for it. We have rituals that surround it. Hope is much harder to come by. The women did not go to the tomb looking for hope. They were searching for a place to grieve. They wanted to be left alone in despair. The terrifying prospect of Easter is that God called these women to return to the same world that crucified Jesus with a very dangerous gift, hope. Hope in the power of God, the unending reservoir of forgiveness and an abundance of love. It would make them seem like fools. Who could believe such a thing? Now we're back to me. We who are in the church who call ourselves Christians are in or on our way to Galilee. We proclaim Christ's resurrection in the flesh or in metaphor. We experience the resurrected one through the Holy Spirit. We go to Galilee not so much to encounter the risen Christ, but to follow him in service and community. Esau Macaulay writes, Christians at their best are the fools who dare believe in God's power to call dead things to life. That is the testimony of the black church. It is not that we have good music, although we do, or excellent preaching, and we do. The testimony of the black church is that in times of deep crisis, we somehow become more than our collective ability. 
we become a source of hope that did not originate in ourselves. Back to me. I am today urging us to proclaim Christ in joy and in hope to untangle all those springtime metaphors and pull out that one thread of resurrection to celebrate as we do at Christ's birth, to have Christ's resurrection as real as his birth is, as real as his death is. I am asking us to risk hope, to opening ourselves, to risk crying out because Jesus' resurrection is real, because Christ's resurrection is real. The power of it is real. It is real that governments and institutions want to silence the voices which call out injustice or negligence. It is real that we are drawn to heaping all our troubles onto one person, one culture, one ethnic um, group. And in doing so, we banish our misfortune and blame it on them. It is real that one person, human, one person, divine, one person can shine a light on wrongdoing and the whole world can be changed. It is real that Jesus led us to the cross where we saw the end and then led us beyond the cross where we can see the future upended. It is real that the future can be, will be redeemed from our fear of hope and remade with our strengthened, radical hope. And <clears throat> Issa McCauley says, as we leave the tombs of quarantine, to return to normal would be a disaster unless we recognize that we are going back to a world desperately in need of healing. For me, he says, the source of that healing is an empty tomb in Jerusalem. The work that Jesus left his followers to do includes showing compassion and forgiveness and contending for a just society. It involves the ever-present offer for all to begin again. The weight of this work fills me with a terrifying fear, especially in the light of all who have done great evil. Who is worthy of such a task? Like the woman, women, the scope of it leaves me too often with a stunned silence. And this is where his writing ends. This holiday is much more than a celebration of spring. It is a declaration of a new time, a new normal, and that even without the quarantine, if we take the resurrection as real, if we live into it, we are living in a new world. We have this opportunity year after year. This year, may we humans, may we God's creation work together and bring that new world into reality. And Christ is risen, right and indeed, alleluia. And thank you to Issa McCauley. <clears throat> and what comes?